Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rich Gaines, and I would like to introduce you to Benjamin Box. Look at him. Isn't he a good box? When Benjamin was younger, he was empty, but full of possibilities. As Benjamin got older, he became filled with society's rules and other people's expectations, and he got attached to those rules and expectations. Do you know what the number one regret is of older people? I wish I had the courage to live my true life and not other people's expectations. I want to acknowledge you for being here because we have a saying that actions have consequences. Everything you do, everything you say, everything you read. And the very fact that you're here means that you made a decision to improve your life. I don't want, to have to have, I don't want you to have any regrets. Turn to your neighbor, give him a double high five, and say, you are a wealth success. I hate you! Slam when the bathroom doors, the ski pole came hurtling towards my brother. As you can imagine, growing up with two older brothers had its challenges, just like keeping the money that we make. Expectations were high and competition was the norm. Whatever I said was dismissed. Whatever I did was discounted. They'd already been through it before. It was no big deal to them. Sometimes that feeling of security seemed uh, just out of reach, just like keeping more of what we make. But money can be magical. The way we plan for it, the way we protect it, the way we preserve it, the way we can turn it into a wealth of values, beliefs, and traditions that can last for generations. Actions have consequences. When I was younger, I've skied all my life, and when I was younger, one ski trip in particular would be different than all the rest. My brothers and I took the gondola high atop the Austrian Alps. It was a beautiful day, a bluebird day as we call it. The sun was shining, the air was crisp, we could see miles below to the town of Kitzbühel. We started our run. Turn after turn after turn. We came to a point where we took a rest. And all of a sudden, a fog descended. But not just any fog, a thick, enveloping fog. We couldn't see more than a foot in front of our face. We stood at a precipice. We'd been in this situation many times before, but on mountains and slopes that we knew and that which we were familiar. High atop the Austrian Alps, we stood at a precipice. Which way do we go? Do we go right? Do we go left? We can't very well go back up the mountain, if you know what I mean. And then three figures descended out of the fog, whoosh, down and to the right. They showed us the way. The fog lifted ever so gently. 20 yards to the left, three brothers would have skied off a cliff. Down and to the right, we continued our ski adventure. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand at a precipice, a precipice of a crisis, a crisis of wealth and legacy. Failure to act has consequences. Families and businesses ripped apart. Brothers and sisters stop talking. Money that could be invested in the business or the family gets wasted on needless lawsuits. We stand at a precipice. What are we supposed to do? Where are we supposed to go? How do we deal with this situation? I don't know too many people that go to a cocktail party and they say, wow, you should see it. I just got my estate or financial plan. Mm. 40 pages of black print on white paper. Wow and a colored binder, 
Mmm, now we're talking. But what if? What if you could go to a cocktail party and while other people are lamenting that they have no plan for wealth, that you could confidently say, not only do you have a plan, but that you take action each and every day on that plan. What do you think are some of the keys to keeping more of what we make? Spend less. Excellent. What else? Save more. Save, spend less, save more. Okay. How do you save more? Give us an example of how you save more. Well, I would pay yourself first. Ooh, ding. Okay. She gets the, she gets the, uh, the, the award for that one. That's my favorite. Pay yourself first. I think that's one of the most critical things in financial and tax and estate planning that a person can do. Pay yourself. But how many of us do that? How many times in business, what do we do? I love this one. We're on the hamster wheel, right? Day after day after day, sales, 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 sales. And then what happens? We got the, hole, the bucket, and there's a hole in the bucket, and it just goes right out through that bucket. I've really focused on this a lot lately, kind of the testing of the proof to see if, if I see this and how people run their business. It's what I hear. It's what I see all the time. They're chasing, chasing, chasing after that next sale, and they forget that there's a massive amount of things that you can do when you simply spend a little less and you pay yourself first and you build those assets. So we believe, or I believe, that there are six keys or maps to wealth. Three of those maps or keys are plan, protect, and preserve. People plan their vacation. They plan to buy a home. They plan to have a child. Planning for wealth and legacy? They'd rather listen to fingernails scraping on a chalkboard. Protect. Protect is about being in compliance and building a castle around your business and what you own. Preserve, making it last for generations. When we talk about planning, there's good plans and there's bad plans. Bad planning is what I call fail. Family anger in lawsuits. You don't know me, I, it, my bio's in, in your materials. I'm a 30-year tax attorney, state, and pl state planning and taxation. So I've been doing this for a very, very long time. And I see what happens when the plans don't work. I see the litigation on the other side. I see the beneficiaries going at each other. I see them suing the trustees. This is what happens, family anger and lawsuits, when we don't do good planning. When there's bad planning, there's fail. Financial abundance is lost, right, Windus? Yes. When there's bad planning, there's failure. Family, uh, family achievement is undermining real enrichment. What can we do for the family? What do we do to build up the family, the family unit? So those are the three keys that I think are relevant to planning. And, that's, and when we have bad plans, so what's a good plan look like? A good plan has four simple words. What do you want? What do you want? Four simple words, they're very massive. What do you want? What do you want for your business? What do you want for your lifestyle? What do you want for your family? Do you want a business that you work and you die? And it's done. Most professionals have that, right? Most attorneys, most doctors, you see them, they work till they die and that's it. Maybe they're lucky to sell some kind of dentist, same thing. Maybe they're lucky to sell something at the end of the day, but most of the time they're thinking is I work what I do. It's almost like having a job, right? The self-employed. Um, do you want to sell your business? You want to build it up and grow it and sell it? Do you want to transfer it to your kids? Are the kids going to become engaged in the family business and promote that family business for generations? Are you going to bring in a separate management group that will manage the company and so you get to go off and do the things you like to do, whether it's golf or tennis or skiing or bike racing, whatever it is. So that's what good planning is about. What do you want? So how do we get to what do you want? I call it the seven clarities. One of those clarities is purpose. Now purpose, the way I define purpose, 
is what makes you different than everybody else on this planet. What's your culture? What's your upbringing? What are your values? What are the things that make you who you are and what you love to do that's different than anybody else on this planet? For me, it's teaching. I love to teach. I love to be up here. I love it. It's what, it's, it's everything that I was raised to be. It's how I grew up, it's what was expected, it's the, all the things that I did. And when I really got in touch with what I love to do, so I was running a practice for you know, 20 some odd years and one day I was sitting in my office and I looked up out the window and I said, I, I can't do this for another 25 years, I can't do it. There's gotta be something more, there's gotta be something better, there's gotta be something bigger in this world. And so I started going through that transformation process of what am I going to do? Who am I? Larry and I were just having that conversation. Who are we? What do we really want to do? What's our true self? So what I'd like you to do is open up your workbooks and take about a minute and write down what you think your true purpose is in life. Time starts now. Go. and time. May I have someone share what they think their purpose is? Who would like to share? I'll share. Great. Would you please stand up? And what is your name? Judy Reynolds. Hi, Judy Reynolds. Nice Hello. to see you. Glad you're here. Thank you. Great. Tell me a little bit about what you wrote down for your purpose. Wonderful. So what does um, mother, daughter, and friend mean? How do you implement that each and every day? What do you do to act on that? If I have a thought, I act on it. So if I, something comes up in my head that I want to share with my children or my mom, I act on it immediately. I don't put it off till tomorrow. Okay. Um, in line with values, things like that? Values, Your integrity, values, who you are? Yep. Right, exactly. Um, things that I think would help them. And the second one again? Ah, so what does legacy mean to you? Legacy to me would be to leave them financially in a place. Mm. When I'm gone, I want, I want to leave something for them. Okay, great. Um, whether that's my home, my financial group that I have with Windus. Okay. Um, I want to leave something for them so they don't have struggles. Fabulous, thank you. Let's give her a hand. So what I heard here were two areas. I heard the first area was she wanted to be a loving mother um, to her children, which is the integrity and the values piece, but she also wanted to leave a legacy. So there's obviously a legacy of values and beliefs that, you know, and traditions that you leave, but also the financial piece. And so the combination of both of those together is congruence. Anyone else? Who else would like to share? Please stand up, Larry. And I just, I just said your name, so I, we know who you are, but yes, Larry. Welcome, Larry, yes. Beautiful. Fantastic. Thank you. Please have a seat. Let's give him a hand. Larry's in a great space. He um, had businesses. He's built businesses. He took time off. He traveled the world. And he's come back and he's looking to, as he said, to be a connector and to help people find that inner peace and that inner truth that's their, their truth. Because he's seen what's, what is out there in the world and how a lot of times, I guess if I can paraphrase for you, how the United States has a certain culture of, uh, of maybe competition and we have to be better than the other person behind us and the Joneses and all those things. And yet, we never find real contentment in that. Well, I shouldn't, that, that's a generalization. Not everybody finds real contentment in that. And as we get older, we start to look for that thing. So I'm 58 now, I can't even believe it. And when I hit 50, for me, it was about, oh my God, let's just get rid of all that stuff that was there. And the 50s became a massively creative time for me, really, really enjoyable. So I think that's, part, if I can paraphrase, I think that's what you're saying. Okay. Awesome. So that's our purpose. Let's do the second one, and then I'll finish with that piece because uh, we want to get Windus up here. Um, and so the second piece is our vision. Vision for me 
is the difference that you make in the world. What are you going to do to make a difference in the world? That's vision. So take about another minute or two and write down what you think your vision is. Our vision in our company is to change the way people think and talk about wealth, not just in money, but in values, beliefs, and traditions. What a different world we would have if we, were, if we are successful in achieving that, building wealth inside of families, not having to rely on banks, not being beaten down by the system. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm not going to have you talk about the vision. What I want to do now is I want to segue into, as you've seen, we, we kind of started out with big picture about what the concepts are, what the challenges are, bringing it down into purpose and vision. So we're going to drill down a little bit more now. It's my pleasure to bring up Windus to share our next segment. Let's give her a hand, please. So um, I've helped uh, people with their budget from just out of college all the way through until in retirement and worried that they're going to outlive their money. So it doesn't actually matter at what point you are in your life. Having a conversation about a budget and knowing what you have every single month is relevant. I feel like many people view budget as a bad word. They're afraid of it. And unfortunately, I also find that by being afraid to implement a budget or viewing a budget as a chore, it gives you anxiety on a monthly basis and you don't even realize this, this anxiety exists. So a great example would be I, I had a client this morning, she has plenty of money. It, it's not an, even an issue. The issue is that she doesn't actually know how much she spends every single month. So in her head, how can she know that she has plenty? So knowing how much you spend is, is actually an activity. It creates freedom for you. There's a lot of different ways that people create a budget, and I have some great tools. Before I get into my tools, though, I'd like to talk about some main points about why it is an important exercise. In January, I, instead of surveying the crowd, unless you guys have some input, please feel free to jump in. In January, I find it's one of my busiest months of the year. People survive the holidays and they start the year off behind because the holidays were more expensive than they anticipated. And had they had an understanding of how much the holidays cost every year, they could have planned for it throughout the course of the year, making it less stressful. Because if you knew that you had, I mean, maybe you like to just be really giving to your family in December why should you be giving and then start the year off in debt and feel guilty about it? Travel. How many, I'm sure people have come back from a vacation with credit card debt. And that, that kind of can take away from the enjoyment of the vacation itself. So being able to say that I want to travel and spend $12,000 a year on travel. I want to save $1,000 a month for that. And then you save that every single month so that when you go on that trip, you already have the money. It's very important to understand what your needs are so that when you spend your money, you can enjoy it. All the time I hear people say, oh, you know, I'm having buyer's remorse. I feel like buyer's remorse occurs because you didn't give yourself permission to spend. Why should you work so hard for your money and not get to enjoy it and then regret when you decide to buy a nice blouse or go out to a nice dinner? Another critical issue that people have is that they don't live off of the money they have. They live off of money they believe they may in fact earn in the future. Maybe you will or will not get that bonus. Instead of planning on getting the bonus, you should live off of what you have. When you get the bonus, then you should think about how the best way to allocate that is. I know, and I know especially because we have a bookkeeping here, <laughs> bookkeeping person here. I'm sure this, this resonates with you. You see this in, in, in all, every single day, right? So 
it's it really shouldn't be a bad word. It should be an activity in creating freedom for yourself mentally. When I work with clients, one of the best ways I've seen people start taking a step towards a budget is first writing it down. Okay, I can ask people all day long what they spend on their groceries, and I would say maybe 10% actually know within a range what they spend on groceries a month. Th these expenses creep up and they can get you, and it, they can sink your battleship. It's important to assign, so if I earn $5,000 a month, and I know I need this much a month for groceries, then I have a better perspective of where the rest of my money is going to go. Everyone knows what their fixed expenses are. Rents, utilities may fluctuate here and there, but you have a range. But taking the time to try to create an understanding of what your variable expenses are on a monthly basis, it, it helps. So, go back to my notes here. Starting with paper gives you a sense to say, all right, I think I spend $500 a month on groceries, so this is how much I earn on a monthly basis, and these are my bills. Starting a paper gets you to a starting point to understand if you really do, in fact, have enough. But then you need to go a step further. So after paper, there's great software tools out there. So Gary and myself, we actually have great financial planning software that can tie in your budget into our software. There's also mint.com. And I'll write down the, the tools out there. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> so what's great about mint.com is it's, it tracks your swipes. So every time you go to a gas station, every time you go to a grocery store, every time you go out to a dinner or coffee shop, it tracks your swipes. So once you've said, I believe I only spend $200 a month on gas, you can then go use some software to help validate that. And then, on a monthly basis, you can go back and revisit where you off. And Mint actually allows you to set a limit, and it'll send you an email telling you if you've exceeded your budget. Some people may like that. Some people find that annoying. All software, all software has glitches, I guess you can say. It is tracking your swipes. Periodically, your vendor may not um, come through correctly. So maybe gas gets swiped incorrectly as groceries. So you do have to track it. But the point is there are tools out there that can help reduce the amount of energy you have to spend on it. Because the last time I told a client to save all their receipts and add them up, pretty sure I got laughed at. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever actually seen anyone keep all their receipts and add them up. But it's a nice, oh, that's, that's good, that's good. Nice. All right, rare, that's rare. There are also some other excellent tools. So once you've kind of gotten a perspective, this is how much I earn, this is actually how much I'm spending, there's a great tool out there. This is a free tool. This other tool is not free. It's called youneedabudget.com. What I like about youneedabudget.com is it goes in and there's actually a free month trial and you can take all their webinars and classes. It tries to say, reiterating the message, you need to live off of what you just earned, not on what you think you're going to earn. And it gives you some lessons and education and support to help you understand and dig deeper on how to do that, because it's actually a little bit harder than people expect. I, you know, some people have their escrow account built into their, sorry, their, their property taxes built into their, their impound account or escrow account, and, and so they don't have to plan for that. Others don't. I get feedback from people all the time about hidden things that sneak up throughout the year. The most important thing I stress when you talk about budgeting is to look at your whole year and try to identify all of the expenses that are big lump sums and create savings accounts to have that and set aside for that on a monthly basis. The last thing you need to do is try to come up with, like dig and come up with money. When had you just saved a, a little bit on a monthly basis, it wouldn't have been stressful at all. And again, to go back and reiterate a little bit, I think things that creep up on people would be vacations, um, holidays, birthdays. You know, I just um, I have two little kids, and I just planned their birthday. And I can tell you, I mean, you have to plan for that stuff on a monthly basis if you want to have a, a reasonable birthday, birthday party. <laughs> Prepare yourself, Gary. He's got a young baby. <laughs> All right, so again, just to start with the budget, start with paper, 
take a look at what you're earning consistently on a monthly basis. Try not to live off of unplanned like bonuses or commissions. Try to live off of what you know you can attain on a monthly basis and track your expenses to the best of your ability so that you can break out all the things on a monthly basis so it doesn't sneak up on you and you don't need to use a credit card to get by. The last part about a budget is debt. Oh, and before I forget, a great website. If you want to start with pen and paper, Vertex42. I had an engineer find this site for me. Vertex42 actually has all of these great spreadsheets on it. It even has a spreadsheet for a new baby, a spreadsheet for a travel, but they have an incredible monthly spreadsheet that asks you all these questions, like what do you spend on travel, and it helps you. To me, this is why you start with paper, because you can brainstorm and identify where your pitfalls might be. Debt planning. Vertex42 also has some tools for, for debt planning. There are various issues that creep up, whether or not it's student loan debt in someone's life, or maybe they're trying to get ahead of their debt and get out of debt. When you have debt, there are ways in which you can target getting out of debt. And credit cards can hold you down with the way that the interest is, is credited on a monthly basis, right? So uh, what we've seen, there's a couple websites out there that help people consolidate debt and get it onto a fixed payoff. And I'll, I've had clients use Lightstream.com or Lending Club. I think the biggest thing is getting the debt on a fixed payoff schedule so that you can exit the need to use your credit cards is really important. And if you're trying to make lump sums towards your credit cards on a monthly basis, but then all you end up doing is triggering having to reuse your credit cards, this isn't going to help you. So this is why I try to get people off that hamster wheel and find tools that can help them get away from that. Do you have any questions about that? Anyone? Um, all right. So I'll turn it back over to Rich. Good job. Our next segment, we're going to talk about preservation. So with all the budgeting that you've done, with all the planning that you've done, how do you take that wealth and that money that you've managed to keep and preserve it? When we talk about preservation, we have a, a really bad character. I call him the tax demon. So the tax demon is who? The what? The U.S. government. Right. The IRS. Who said the IRS? You did. The IRS. Correct. So the IRS is looking to take your money away from you. And then we have the tax angels. The tax angels are the planning and, and financial and estate planning and tax strategies that we use to keep money in your pocket. Preservation is about making it last for generations. And that goes to kind of the core of what I've done in my career, which is the estate planning work, which is wills and trusts and things like that. So let me talk a little bit about what happens when you don't have a plan. When you don't have a plan, you don't do a trust, you don't do a will, you have no plan in place, what's going to happen is you're going to end up in court. And it's called probate. These days, unless it's really, 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 really simple, which is like owning one house, and that takes about six months to seven months just to get that um, out of the court system so it can go to the people you want it to go to, a probate can take anywhere up to, let's call it a year to two years, depending upon complexity. And if there's challenges inside the probate, you know, all bets are off. It could be years before the things that you want to have happen go to your beneficiaries. So when you don't have a will, when you don't have a trust, you'll go through the probate process. And the probate process is very costly. It's usually about, let's call it 2% of the gross value of what you have. We just talked about debt. So if you have a home and you have some um, um, investment accounts and some bank accounts, and let's say that's all worth about a million two, and you have a mortgage of about eight hundred thousand dollars, so your net worth four hundred thousand dollars, it doesn't matter. The probate fee is based on the million two. 
So 2% of that, you're paying, what, $24,000 in probate fees. And guess what? The person that's going to come in and he's going to represent what you own in court also gets the same fee. So what did I say, 22, 24, 24? Is that what I said? 24. So $24,000 plus another $24,000. So $48,000 just to get your home and a few bank accounts and maybe some investment accounts when you don't do a trust, when you don't have a plan in place. It's extremely costly. That's the bad news. So the good news is, what do we do to avoid that? And that's where we have four primary documents. So the first document is a power of attorney for financial matters. The power of attorney for financial matters is used while you're still alive, and it's used if you get sick. It's the best way I can describe it. So if you have a temporary illness, maybe a partial stroke, something where you're just not able to take care of your financial affairs, you need people to call the banks, you need people to write your checks, you need people to um, deal with the life insurance companies, deal with Trilogy and the investment accounts, your financial power of attorney can do that on a temporary basis until you're, until you're well again. We have the power of attorney for health care. Just like it sounds, if you have an illness and you cannot make health care decisions for yourself, then we want somebody to be able to do that for you and make those decisions. Then we get into the more meaty documents, which is we do a will. And a will accomplishes two, two primary purposes. First is that if you have small children, we want to name a guardian. Who's going to feed, clothe, and shelter your children? So that's what the will is used for. The will also acts as a backup or a backstop to the trust. If for some reason there's some asset out there that didn't get into this trust that I'm going to talk about, and we have to go into court, one of the things that we can do in court is we can ask the judge to say, Your Honor, it should have been in the trust. Would you please say that it is in the trust? And then we can avoid probate. And so that's what the will accomplishes, is it gives us an integrated whole, everything being integrated together to um, move, to, 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 to assure that your assets will go to who you want in the most expeditious way possible. The trust is really the essence. A trust is a private document. Nobody gets to see it. And it sets out, essentially, in essence, your wishes. Who do you want to give property to, your assets to? When do you want to give it to them? And how do you want to give it to them? What happens in this field is a lot of times we start seeing the idea of the commodity. Well, I can just get it done either on LegalZoom or I can just go to some attorney who's only going to charge me, you know, $1,000 to get this trust. The problem is there's a lot of drill downs, there's a lot of details, there's a lot of specific things that we get into and ask questions about in terms of what do you want. Those four simple words, what do you want? So here's an easy example. We were talking about the $1.2 million. So if you have $1.2 million and you have two kids, $600,000 each. And so when we talk to people, you know, we say, well, okay, you want to give them a third at what age? 25. So you want to give them a third at age 25, a third at age 30, and a third at age 35. That is the standard in the industry. It's, it's like, I don't know where it came from, but all the books, all the CDs, everything, it's like that is the, the dimension. What's the thinking around it? Well, if they screw it up at 25, they'll get some at 30. And if they screw that up, there's still a little bit left, okay? So let's bring it down to reality because when I ask this question, this is where the jaws drop. And I say, so what you're really telling me is, is each kid has $600,000 that can be allocated to them. So what you're really telling me is that you're going to give $200,000 to your 25-year-old. That's what I get. The silence is deafening. That's when we have a real conversation with them. Because the percentages, I don't know why, but the percentages, they don't, they don't mesh. It doesn't, it's something about it. They don't equate the percentages to the dollars. And so when I hit them with a third really means $200,000, they go, oh, that's not what I want. Then we have a real conversation. So what do you want? What are your beliefs? What are your values? What's important to you in the family? How do you want to build wealth? Right? Um, what restrictions might we put? So restrictions could be that... Um, well, I actually, let me talk about incentives. That's actually an easier way to go. So what incentives do you want to put into your document? One of the incentives that I love is we'll give you a little bit of money, 
call it 50,000, 100,000. If you can prove that you can keep that money and not blow it and not lose it for say a year, then we'll match it in another year. So think about that for a second. What's the best way, no offense to Windows here, but what's the best way to save $100,000? What? Not spend it. Not spend it. Well, okay, but where are you going to put it? Bank. You put it in a bank, right? Or you put it with Windows. So you put it in a bank, you put it with Windows, right? And you do nothing but just let it sit so you don't lose it. But th I want you to think about that. So you've got a 25-year-old, right? You've given them $75,000, $100,000. Now, I get wills and trusts is about death, but I'm going to bring, I'm gonna bring that, um, sorry, it's about death. That's the future. We're going to bring it back to the present because the present is about the actions you take today to instill the right <coughs> discipline and the right thinking in the kids and the family. So if you bring it back to today, yeah, the 